I had the opportunity to visit Pompeii recently, and you should definitely check out the video I did on this channel, as well as on my other channel, Scorpio Martianus, to see some of the fabulous Roman inscriptions in Latin. Most people are familiar with Latin inscriptions in the typical Roman capital, like we see on these amazing gravestones, which even have apices, which mark long vowels. See my video about the Macrons in the ancient period to learn more about that. But besides that traditional Roman capital, I was really moved by seeing a certain kind of handwriting that is often seen on the walls, and it's known as rustic capitals. These forms have a fluid elegance, something between the Roman cursive handwriting, which we'll talk about in a future video, and traditional Roman capitals that are inscribed into marble. And I learned how to write in these rustic capitals from someone I actually had gone to Pompeii with, Stefano Vittori. On Stefano's channel, he has a whole video in Latin where he explains exactly how to write the rustic capitals. And what I'm going to do in this video is give the same instructions in English as Stefano gave in Latin. So this is what I recommend you do. Watch this video, learn how to write rustic Roman capitals with me, and then go over to Stefano's video and watch the whole thing in Latin. Stefano is one of the most fluent speakers of Latin I've ever met. In addition to speaking in the restored classical pronunciation fluently, he also speaks fluently in the Italian ecclesiastical pronunciation. And in the video I'm directing you to, he happens to be speaking in the ecclesiastical pronunciation. And if you're used to the restored classical pronunciation, I still recommend you watch this video because it's important to get used to both pronunciation systems in order to be a speaker of Latin in the 21st century. So, how to write rustic capitals? Well, this is how I learned from Stefano Vittori and, uh, well, some caveats. They seem to be designed especially for paintbrushes on walls or also for smaller handwriting. Before the invention of pens, especially the innovation of quill pens as we tend to know them from an earlier period, there were paintbrush pens, the Galamus. Galamus, let's see if I can write that in Roman capitals. In the rustic capitals, I mean. So, there's the... Yeah. Should be longer. Galamus, Greek word for a something like this. It's a it means a cylindrical thing which has ink in it. Um, so this is not really. I mean, it's, it's for the ancient kind of kalamus, which is certainly a paintbrush, or very similar to the brushes that are used in the calligraphy for, say, Japanese or Chinese. Uh, that's what uh, ancient Romans and Greeks had, this calamus. Now, uh, I'm using a calligraphy pen because it gives me this uh, different form. As Stefano Vittori explains in his video, the rustic capitals are rather fluid. They really shouldn't be very sharp, and I am new at this. I'm not particularly skilled at doing this yet. He's an expert at it, so that's why you should definitely see his video. But like I said, I wanted to give an English language, an English language explanation for my understanding so far. So, uh, how do we do this? The, one of the elements, one of the most important elements, is this vertical with a little foot. And we're going to make several letters out of this. This vertical with a little foot is the letter I. This is exactly what the letter I looks like. It has a vertical element and a foot, and that's really important. Now, there's no deliberate putting of any kind of uh, head on top of this or any kind of roof. It's just the, uh, just the vertical part and then a foot. Occasionally, because of course this, are, this is paintbrush based, you might see something like that. There's a little bit of a tick or something, but that's not really um, a deliberate motion as much as it's an incidental one. So the fundamental aspect of the letter I is this. And that's E, letter I in Latin. Now from this, based on that, instead of doing a short foot, we do a slightly long foot, longer foot, or even a very much longer foot, and we get the letter L. So there's an L. Now, uh, I looks like this. We're used to, say, the uh, Roman look, Roman look, more standard look of a capital I looking like that, or maybe with nothing at all. That's what we think of a letter I, but don't let this confuse us too much, uh, because that's an I, and that is a T. That is, because we always use this foot. This foot is really nice because it gives us a sense of the bottom of the line for a lot of, of the letters. A lot of the bottoms of these letters have some kind of little foot on it, so we can see where the bottom of the line is. Um, so this is a T. You might see it slightly uh, longer, but not necessarily. One of the lovely features about these Roman uh, rustic capitals is they can be very tall and very narrow, very 
uh, kind of uh, tall and elegant, which uh, I like, very thin looking. So uh, the next letter that we can make based off of the letter I is the letter E. So you have the foot and that's an E. They could have the uh, horizontal elements somewhat longer potentially, but often they're very narrow like this. And I really love that about it. Now, say we start to make an E and instead of a short one, we make a longer tap. Well, that's an F. So that's an E and that's an F. Now, one of the reasons it's nice to learn how to do this and why I'm glad I've done the teensy weensy bit of study I have of these rustic uh, Roman capitals is that now I can read the inscriptions in Pompeii and Herculaneum much more easily because I'm a little bit used to these patterns. You know, if that's, a, and of course I can read Latin fluently, but to read it with this um, rather, to me, unusual form, that's difficult. But if we try to practice this just one time and write a few lines in Latin, I know from my own experience, it makes it much, much easier to read. So that's a good reason to write things out. It's also a good reason to write in the target language at all, just to, uh, to learn it, whether we're using the standard orthography or not. Well, we can use the same vertical part, so the vertical and the foot, and based on that, we do a little bitty curve, and that's a P, that's a P, just like that. That's all we need for the P. Now, from the P, and then if we do a little P, and we have a nice, long, fluid R, ah, now that's an R, and that's how we get the R. Using again this basic E, the letter I, matrix, we can take this and then we can just add on to it that and we get the letter D. Doing something very similar, how do we get a B? We do a little one just the same size of the P, then we hook it together and we get the B. Sometimes this connects, sometimes it doesn't. And we can also use the same basic form and do this and we get an N. Sometimes it has a little hooky thing at the top, sometimes it doesn't. And that's because of just the, the paintbrush uh, glancing the page. It's not really a part of it though. And we can also get a letter H with the basic I form. So that, and then we have the horizontal element, and then it uh, comes down like this, and oftentimes we get even this little hook up here, the hook that can be added separately. Now, as far as stroke order goes, like if you know Chinese or Japanese, you know that the stroke order of the characters is really essential. I don't know what they are. I've mostly imitated Stefano here, but um, you can kind of do whatever you think uh, is appropriate as far as, I, as far as I know. So again, if you want the letter Y, the Ypsilon, got a curve up there like that, horizontal, and also has a hook like that. And that'll make it very different looking from the letter U, which we'll see a bit later. And finally, and now we're getting a little smooshed in here, somewhat like we can with actual writing on the walls, which is why these letters are pretty cool because you can smush them together in all kinds of fun ways. We have the letter I as our base, and then we get the letter K. All right, so that's our first matrix. Uh, now, if we want to, and we can take a diagonal, such matrix, which looks something like that, and we can start with the letter A. Ah, looks like that. That's one way to do the letter A a diagonal version of the letter I, and then a slash. Now, we're, while we are used to a letter A having that horizontal part, uh, the rest of capitals essentially never have that horizontal part. So it also looks like uh, a little bit like the Greek letter lambda, which is a lot of fun. Um, there's no lambda, obviously, in Latin, so there's no confusion at all. So it's just a way of saving time, which is pretty great. If we want to kind of double that up, so we have the Diagonal part, A essentially, and then we kind of do it again. Oh, that's an M. And something that's really nice about these is these are really similar to the Roman cursive handwriting, which we'll see later. So if we go from the basic uh, block or capital letters, the Roman marmoreal inscription letters, we learn this, and then we'll see that learning the cursive handwriting, how that works is um, much easier once we're used to this. Let's do another diagonal. And then if we cross it, we get an X. There's a lovely X. And if we want a letter Z or Z, we start with that. In fact, we want it to be longer, right? And then we cross the top and we get a letter Z or Z. And one more element that we'll need is the basic curve. And this is essentially the letter C. Uh, we see though, the letter C usually, it seems like it has maybe they pick up the brush and then they curve it down and then they add something to the bottom. Or might, maybe they do it as one fluid stroke, 
for the letter C, or maybe they do this kind of curvy part and then they add a little bit to the top and the bottom. Uh, I think I've seen variations of all that. It's a little bit hard to tell when they're you know, looking at 2000 year old ink on ancient walls. Um, but uh, perhaps all of these are, are all normal and common. But something like that gives you the basic shape of the letter C. Now we do the same thing um, and just a little bit curved in more. And of course, get a little bit of the top there. And we get the letter G. O is formed with two of them. There's an O. Q is the same as the O. And we get a nice, long, elegant tail. Isn't that fun? I love that. That's why these are great. These long, flowing lines, that's a nice, elegant part that you can incorporate into your own personal style, as of the style of uh, people who are making advertisements for politicians and such. So we need to do a couple more letters here, which don't have a particular matrix or matrix. And uh, that is to do the letter U or V, which of course are not distinguished in the ancient period. These are, these are valid from what I understand from the first to the ninth century. And I'm doing these regular letters. I should be doing it in the Roman rustic capitals because they look more fun. There we go, AD. <laughs> so uh, from the first to ninth century, AD more or less is uh, when these apparently were used both in print. There's a lot of printed books, old manuscripts like Virgil's Aeneid. I believe there's several copies which are written like this that are preserved from antiquity, not from Virgil's uh, time to my knowledge, but uh, they're, they are quite old. So that's how to do an OO. Now, um, something else that I've seen often is that the second part often has a little thing on the top. Maybe it's sort of a, a roofing part, or maybe it's just sort of a, an incidental aspect of the paintbrush. Uh, and even it can look sometimes quite a bit more like the letter Y, but you see that these are very different looking. These are not very similar looking at all, so it'll be easy to, to distinguish them. The last letter is the letter S. And Stefano mentions there's three ways. There's this, and you have a top part, you have a bottom part. Um, in fact, let me do that again, something like that. Or you could do it as, uh, I think he does two like that, or even as one stroke. So there's different ways that uh, Stefano's mentioned it can be done. Now let's write some things in Latin. Let's write the beginning of one of my favorite uh, poems. Uh, one of the first ones ever memorized from Familia Romana. And it starts like this. It's non egonobilium sedios studiosus equorum. So let's start with the N. So we need the shape of an I first. Get that. Non. And we do the interpunct, the interpoint, interpunct. Um, if you if you like, I mean that's how these inscriptions normally are, and that's what we're training to do, right? So non. There's an e. O. Ego. No. Non bi li un. I like adding that. You don't have to go. Diagonal for the M. Of course, this isn't well aligned either. It's very difficult to do this because the camera's kind of in the way. But um, thank you in advance. Like I said, I'm not an expert at all at this. So non ego no bilion. Uh, I just do this one. Actually, it doesn't look great, but that's fine. Se Theo And well actually I wouldn't put an interpunct there because I'm gonna go in the next line, but whatever. Studio. Uh oh, the T. How silly of me. Well we all make mistakes. Including the ancients. Quite a lot actually. That's a T, right? Stu. T. O, do an U like that, so the O, sus, no, nego no, bilion sedeo, sedeo sus, secorum. 
Now, um, there, I haven't seen any with uh, the apices or the things that mark long vowels. Uh, if we would, it might be probably very light and scarcely noticeable would probably be the way to do it. It's a little bit like that. Non ego, no milium, sedeo studiosus equorum. Like that. So this is my understanding of how to do the rustic capitals. Uh, hopefully this is, a, and obviously they don't look that great. And uh, I don't think they look terrific yet. I've just started doing this. But again, like I said, go to Stefano Vittori, see his video about it learn how to do it, and then once you can, I bet you'll be able to understand how to read this sort of writing a lot better. Now that you learned how to write rested capitals in this video in English, go to Stefano's video and subscribe to his channel, learn how to do it in Latin. He probably has some details that I might have left out that even if you don't speak Latin well, you might understand pretty well. And when you get there and after you've subscribed to his channel, leave him a nice comment, letting him know that I sent you there. And if you're interested in learning about the origins of the alphabet, I really recommend you go over to Jackson Crawford's channel. He, in collaboration with another YouTuber named Luke Gorton, they talked about the origin of the alphabet and indeed how that becomes the Greek and Roman alphabets, as well as the Old Norse runes. It's a really fascinating story. Definitely subscribe to their channels and learn about this fascinating history. Stay subscribed to Polymathy because in the next video of this series, we're going to talk about how to do the Roman cursive handwriting. Thank you so much for liking, subscribing, and sharing this video. We'll see you next time. Valete in proximo.